This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Alec Trachtenberg, man. How you doing, Alec? Good. How you doing? I'm as good as I can be in this crazy mix-up world we live in. (laughs) (laughs) And getting crazier by the second. Um, I'm excited to have you on the show, man. Uh, You reached out to me uh, last year. (laughs) Thank you for your patience. Um, You you reached out to me last year um, about your new book, um, uh, the name Lights, uh, Lights, Camera, Sell. Uh, how to actually sell selling techniques and sales techniques in the filmmaking world, which is like I was saying earlier, sacrilege. You don't talk about salesmanship in in art and filmmaking. I'm an artist. I don't have to think about money and sales. That's somebody else's problem. Um, that's what uh, most filmmakers think, which is to their detriment. Um, and we, as we were talking, both the rise of the film entrepreneur and lights, camera, cell are great companion pieces. Um, because they both go into very different. I mean, a lot of the stuff that you talk about in Lights, Camera, Cell uh, could easily be applied to the film entrepreneur method and vice versa. Um, so I think they're really great companion pieces. Um, but before we get started, man, how did you get into the business? Yeah, so um, it's funny. I actually, uh, when I went to college, I went to Loyola and Marymount, which is a, a pretty big film school, but I actually didn't major in film, I majored in communication studies. Um, you know, did some uh, short films on the side. I've always had an interest for producing. And then eventually I created, uh, I produced a feature film um, called The Cabin, which my, with my director, who's from Sweden. Um, so it was a, a, you know, little indie film we shot out in Sweden back in 2017. Um, it got picked up on uh, distribution domestically. Um, and they're also representing us um, internationally as well. Um, but yeah, you know, got the film on to Amazon. Um, you know, Hulu, all, all the different sites up there. And, you know, I've always had a passion for film, um, but I also, you know, just working in, in sales myself, I'm um, working at a variety of companies, um, you know, that help companies like Airbnb, Amazon, um, and kind of, you know, driving more sales and awareness about their products. I saw there was a huge overlap in, you know, what I was doing as a film producer and what I was doing in sales as my day job. Very cool. And then you decided to write the book Lights, Camera, Sell. Uh, which is, I, I'm assuming you saw a, a hole in the marketplace for a sales book in independent filmmaking. And it's not only sales of movies, but it's also sales of yourself as a, as a filmmaker, a company, your career, uh, and your projects, and a script, whatever, any kind. And that's the thing that people don't understand. And please uh, let me know what you think is people don't understand that sales is in our lives every day, all the time. It's not just the 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 weaselly guy selling a a used car somewhere i mean it's sales of like what are we having for dinner tonight you've got to sell <laughs> your what what you want and you know you got to t- you know talking like oh i want to go to this place well it's constant throughout throughout the life and i kind of figured that out early on when i was even trying to date girls in high school i'm like it was a yep. sales it was a sales presentation. Oh. You know, I had to, I had to, I had to, I had to, fi- I had to prospect. I had to fi- I had to, you know, f- provide value. I'm like, if you go out on a date with me, you will get this and this, and look at how cool I am. All these kind of kind of um, sales techniques I was doing instinctively back then, um, yeah. but now I, as an adult, I kind of realized what I was doing. So, um, do do you agree with all that? Oh, I totally do. I mean, in every aspect of your life, whether, you know, you have a child and you're trying to convince your child to to be, you know, behave in a public space or, you know, like you mentioned dating. I mean, Tinder is like a prospecting platform. I mean, you know, you're going on these on these websites and trying to find your best match and you're trying to demonstrate value by the photos you post and the things that you say. Um, and, you know, sales pre- presentations are those dates in themselves, right? When you're going out and, you know, you're showing what you can provide, right? So, yeah, and, I mean, sales is such a, an important aspect of everything that you want to, you know, be able to do and accomplish in the world. Yeah, and even as a, as a filmmaker, when you're on set, uh, it's sales all the time. You know, if you're a DP, you're trying to sell your shot to the director. If you're a director, yep. you're trying to sell your vision for the film to the actors and to the crew and and working with like it's you know unless you're a dictator and then that generally generally doesn't work out very well um but you're generally always you're always selling you know like like uh, abc always be always be a uh, closing always be closing yeah, yeah that was from uh, glenn clary and ross but but you're always selling 
it was such a crazy. And it's movie. funny, you kind of harped on that idea with the used car salesman. I mean, there's so many negative connotations towards the word sales. And I think a lot of artists and, uh, you know, people in the film community don't really want to align themselves with that type of, you know, personality or, or uh, role, right? Because, you know, usually when you think of sales, you think of being pushy or aggressive. Um, you know, people, you know, tend to say, you know, that's not for me. I don't do that, right? But, but dece you know, dece like deceitful, like being deceitful and things like that. Like a used car salesman, right, to screw you yeah. over. But, you know, at the end of the day, sales is really all about, like, you know, understanding value and, you know, finding common connection with another person and figuring out ways that, you know, both parties can work together um, for the benefit, right? Um, you know, you, if you're an artist and you have amazing scripts, so like if you're a writer, right? I mean, you're providing value to a production company who, you know, would love your, your projects to, to be able to produce them and put them out into the world. Um, but it's how you convey that and how you communicate it is really important. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I used to, when I first launched Indie Film Hustle, I would get some slack from some of my contemporaries because they just saw my unrelenting um, just uh, just sales, constantly marketing and promotions and, and, and just pushing and pushing and pushing. Um, but I felt that I had a strong value proposition. I felt that like I'm providing a value. I'm not... I'm giving away 95% of what I do on a daily basis. So it's not even like I'm selling, selling, selling. I need you to give me my money. No, I want to help. And I wanted to get that information out there as much as possible. And I still do that to this day. Um, and it's been it's been helpful. And it's it's helped me grow Indie Film Hustle to where it is. But a lot of a lot of other creatives, they don't have that that they have that same kind of block that you're talking about. Whereas like I don't want to be associated with sales or snake oil salesmen, which is literally one of the origins of the bad sales. You know, the guy, the guy that comes into town, tells you a whole bunch of lies, steals your money and sells you like, you know, whatever oil to drink to, to get rid of cancer, <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever that is. Uh, and, and I get it. I get and, and movies have not helped, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah, I can name so many movies out there that you know portray salespeople not to be the greatest people in the world. <laughs> right, they're a great villain. They're a great villain. But I think filmmakers, well, I think people in general are starting to come around to the idea that sales is an integral part, and it doesn't have to be dirty. It doesn't have to be sleazy. It actually nope. is all about providing value, and and convincing people that have a problem and serving that. Convincing people that like if you have a problem, what I'm proposing could help you, and that's across all business. Um, in regards to getting a job in a job interview, you're you're yeah. you're sales. You're in sales in a, like, a job interview. Yeah, same thing. You know, you could be the greatest director in the world, but you know, if you go in, you know, with that conversation to that producer or that agent, and you don't, you know, communicate that or build that rapport, um, you know, it, you're gonna it's gonna be lost talent. You know, and nothing is worse than wasted talent. Oh, God, I know. And I see it all the time in my in my line of work where I talk to a lot of these great artists um, that I see some great movies. I'm like, but you're not going to they didn't they didn't get the sales aspect. They don't get the marketing and promotions aspect of it. In your book, you have um, two great um, kind of explanations of sales and how important it is to to filmmakers. Uh, can you talk about the Robert Rodriguez example and the Quentin Tarantino example in your book? Yeah, so. Robert Rodriguez, uh, you know, it's actually his his father was in sales. Um, I didn't know uh, that. I know. did not know that. Yeah. Yep. And um, so for him, you know, he didn't have any sort of, um, you know, blockings to him being able to go out there and uh, make a film if he wanted to make one. Right. So, you know, he built r rapport with, you know, the people around his community, like, you know, friends and, and really kind of just grassroots went up there and made you know, a feature film. Right. And, uh, you know, it was like, I think it was like $7,000. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and he went out and, and talked to a bunch of, uh, dis distribution companies, put it out into festivals, you know, really, you know, just spearheaded that whole, that whole thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, same with Quentin Tarantino. Uh, so his producer, Lawrence Bender, um, you know, he, if it wasn't for Lawrence Bender to be able to see that talent in, in, um, Quentin's ability to write, um, you know, he wouldn't have posed the question of him to direct, right? So he directed Reservoir Dogs, um, which was an unbelievable movie, right? It really set the platform for, you know, his his directing career um, as not only just an amazing writer, but as somebody who can also, um, you know, direct like a film. So, you know, being able to sell these ideas, even Steven Spielberg, too. I mean, I have an example where Steven Spielberg uh, would just go on the Universal tours and then he would I highly 
recommend you don't do this anymore but if you would like jump off the the, the tram and then uh you know uh went to the, one of the buildings of where all the producers are hanging out and he would just confidently sell them as if he be- belonged there right and then before you know it i mean he got introduced to sin scheinberg who you know was the head of uh universal at the time and like president and you know at that point that's kind of where the launch was and if he didn't have that that kind of ability to to build rapport and you know be aggressive to you know chase his dreams I mean, we wouldn't be able to see E.T. or Jaws or, you know, other amazing movies he's made. So. Now, what is the sales mindset? So the sales mindset is really understanding that, you know, the, the value that you can bring to other people. But not only that, being able to know how to communicate that value. Right. So, um, you know, in terms of understanding like social cues. Right. And like understanding like what like like, for example, if you met. If there was a producer right in front of you, like in the coffee shop, right, like you wouldn't want to go up to the guy and start hounding him and start selling, you know, pitching ideas, right? Like, you know, there's a way to really, you know, do it strategically where, you know, you set up an email um, to him or, or, or somebody, get a referral, uh, find, you know, a way like to, to build it, like, you know, um, get in on, on the right, you know, foot as opposed to just, you know, being random and, and uh, not really having any um, kind of backdrop to what you're saying isn't it isn't it amazing how um people online and in person will walk up to somebody um who and it's happened to me anytime i'm out in in a festival or a market or something like that i always get this to happen to me and many of my guests have as well where you have a filmmaker or, or somebody come up and go hey read my script hey um, watch my trailer, watch my movie. Uh, how can you help me? And it's kind of like this, like energy suckers, I call them. Um, because it's just like, what can you do for me, 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 me? As opposed to um, providing value. And, exactly. and, and and what can I do for you? And how do you build that relationship before you start asking for stuff? And it's not, and it's trying, it's trying to be authentic too, because I, I don't know about you, but you know, my my radar is pretty honed now um, for authentic relationships and and non authentic relationships. And those and sometimes the non authentic relationships are fine if there's an equal exchange of value and it's a business transaction at that point. Um, but if it's a you're actually trying to build a rapport with somebody to truly try to help them with nothing in return, and maybe a year. I mean, I've built relationships that I I never asked for anything. Three years down the line, maybe four years down the line. Um, and we actually built a real relationship. And then when I called them like, Hey dude, can you, can you help me with this or that? They're like, of course, man, after everything you've given me, of course I'll rep- uh, uh, reciprocate. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that approach, which is so it's, it's, it's the equivalent of walking up to a, a pretty girl at a bar and like, you and I are going to go sleep together right now. Just let's get in the car. That's not going to work. That generally doesn't work. That's, generally yeah. doesn't work. And you'll probably get someone called upon you, uh, bouncer no, or I'm- police. <laughs> So what they call in sales is qualification um, process, right? So in the first stage of sales, it's considered uh, prospecting. And that's trying to locate, um, you know, the ideal buyer, the ideal person that's perfect for your service or your project. Um, So, you know, doing research is really imperative. I mean, now that we live in like the digital age where any information you need is at your fingertips. I mean, you, you can type in someone's name on Google and find something on page seven that, you know, you never would have known about, right? And like, you know, really understanding, you know, their background, um, seeing, like trying to find like trends in terms of like, you know, uh, projects that they've worked on in the past, right? What they might be interested in. Um, paying attention to those things. And then when you're in those conversations in that prospecting phase and you're qualifying them, you know, like say things like, oh, I noticed that, you know, the last three films that you that you've worked on have all been comedies. I mean, it seems like comedy is something that's, you know, interesting. You, what's your favorite type of comedy, right? And then, you know, from there, as a writer, you can really try to understand, you know, okay, maybe this producer is more interested in this type of material. So you're not trying to sell him something that isn't going to fit that box, right? So, you know, really trying to understand what value you can bring to what he's looking at or she's looking at at the moment. Now, um, so how do you important. and how do you eliminate wasting time on people who do not benefit from the value that you have in a project or service that you're trying to give? 
So you're saying like, uh, so what do you mean by that? Like, like uh, eliminating uh, wasted time. So like, like a perfect example, I think you kind of talk about it a little bit, but it's kind of like doing a shotgun email to 500 producers because you find their, their email lists on IMDb somewhere and you're sending comedy spots to, uh, you know, Jason Bloom. Like it doesn't. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, those before. yeah. So yeah, I mean, you know, like understanding, you know, having like a target of just a few that you've done really hardcore research on. Um, I'm talking like looked at, you know, their LinkedIn, their IMDb profile, um, you know, saw connections. Maybe you have a, a connection, common connection that you can reach out to that can maybe, you know, introduce you in a warm way as opposed to just, you know, randomly, uh, you know, sending mail. Right. So um, I think it's really important to home just to select few instead of just mass emailing, you know, every single, um, you know, person out there, um, because that's not going to garner the same results. Yeah. I, I get emails, people asking me to, to produce their films and, and find financing for like, they pay, like, can you help me get money for my movie? I'm like, you obviously have no idea who I am, yeah. what, I, what I'm capable of, because I am not your guy. Like you did obviously did not do your research here. I do. I get curry letters. I get query letters from scripts. I'm like, hey, I want you to produce this. They're like, no. Like, where in anything? It's not like I'm I'm hidden. It's not like you can't really do much research on me. There is a ton of stuff out there if somebody really wants to do research on me. And they still don't do it. It's fascinating to me. But I guess that's just laziness. Yeah, it's laziness. But also, like, when you are communicating to that person in an email sequence, like, by, like, mentioning those personal things about that yeah. you know individual you're reaching out to is really important because that's going to show them that you know you really took the time to like you know look them up and care about them right you know like for example alex if i was reaching out to you you know i would say you know i, I love listening to your podcast specifically my favorite you know episode um was with this person right and then kind of explaining you know um what what did you benefit from, like, you know, listening to that particular episode? Um, that's going to show that, you know, you're not just someone who's just randomly reached out to you who, who didn't really know, um, you know, who you, who you talk to and, and all that. And it's so true. I, I'll get I'll get email uh, letters from PR people who obviously have no idea who I am or what I do. And then I'll get uh, emails from other PR people or filmmakers who will do exactly that. They're like, look, we've been listening to you for years, this episode and this episode, and I've done this and I've read that. And, and I take those, I, I actually take the time, if I have the time, to actually look into those more closely than a blanket, just, you know, flat shotgun is template email. Um, it's it's, yeah. fasc it's fascinating. Now, the second the second stage is discovery. What is discovery? So discovery is like the time where like, well, the first off the prospecting stage, you know, the whole goal of that is to schedule a time to be able to communicate with that decision maker, whether that be like a 30 minute, you know, Skype call or meeting for coffee, right? It really depended on, on who you're talking to. For example, you know, if you're speaking to like another DP and your director, you know, maybe meet them up for coffee, right? But <laughs> You know, um, if you're talking to an executive producer, most likely you're going to be going to their office, that, that person's office or, you know, meeting in a common ground. Probably everything is going to be virtual, you know, during the pandemic. But, um, you know, that's the goal is to really just, you know, get on a call with them and ask them questions. So discovery is really that, you know, where you're taking the research that you've done on this person and then asking questions about what they specifically are interested in, what their what, what are their pain points? What are their, um, you know, their goals, right? And then collecting this information, you can then, you know, connect that to, uh, you know, your project or service um, or what you can bring to the table. But, you know, if you go in there blindly trying to sell yourself right off the bat, um, you know, then you're going to, you know, have that used car salesman mentality, which is obviously not been effective. Now, what, what advice would you give on how to vet potential prospects? So um, in the sense of uh, just like making any, sure that they're so just making sure that they're a really great match. I mean, obviously, you could do research. Um, you could do research and, and things like that. But even going deeper, are there any techniques that you use um, to vet them to make sure that that you are a good match in, in whatever you're trying to sell them? Yeah. Um, so understanding like the job title uh, of the person that you're speaking to, um, you know, making sure that you're speaking to a decision maker. Um, so, you know, anything like for a financier, for example, 
Um, you know, understanding if, if the person you're speaking to is the one that could actually write the check or somebody who's associated with that person who, you know, you're they're, they're almost like the gatekeeper in a sense, right? They're trying mm-hmm. to understand, you know, what your project's about and then they relay that information to, you know, the, the key decision maker. But the issue is, you know, the gatekeeper is not going to be able to effectively sell your project or service just as much as you can, right? So, um, or, or as better as you, right? So you really want to make sure that, you know, you're connecting with the right person um, right off the bat. How do you how do you use discovery to vet potential film distributors? Because as you know, it's one of my favorite topics. Um, the, uh, the very... The, if you want to talk about a negative connotations of the sales guys, can you imagine what the connotation is with film distributors? Okay. It's horrible. So what do you do to vet potential uh, distributors for your projects? Yeah, so just as much as is like, you know, if, if a distributor reaches out to you about your project and, and, you know, I'm sure as an independent filmmaker, you're excited. You're like, oh, my God, my movie. They like me. They like me. The world. Everyone likes me. Right. <laughs> but, you know, just like in a job interview, you know, this is just as much of an interview for them than it is for you. Right. So, you know, as you really got to make sure that it's the right opportunity and the right, uh, you know, company for for the goals of your movie. So having a list of questions for that discovery call to really understand like, you know, um, you know, what is the marketing strategy that you have in mind? Um, like, what is the key demographic do you, th- you think that this w- would be for our film, right? Like, you know, uh, females ages 18 to 40 who are into like horror movies, like, you know, really kind of, you know, understand like what they, what they think of your film and see if it aligns with what you think, right? And, um, you know, if they if they make very big promises, you know, it's it's usually a very, you know, um, a big red flag, I'd say. Um, but you want, really want to check to see if that person is genuine. Right. So the questions that you're asking in that discovery call is, you know, most importantly, finding out if they're capable to get your film out there. Most importantly, are if they're genuine and they actually are like, you know, passionate about your project and you're not just going to be one out of, you know, 200 films that they're going to take to can next year to try to sell. You know, right. Exactly. And they um, yeah, there's a couple of bigger uh, independent film distributors who shall remain nameless, who, who who pump out 30 releases a month, 40 releases a month. Um, it's impossible to show tender, loving care to every one of them. It's just impossible. They're just a factory at that point. Um, so it's 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 always interesting. And, and and people filmmakers listening right now, when you do get that email, which is so it's like I said, they like me. Oh my God, they like me. You feel like you've won something. Um, they, uh, a lot of times they use that as their, to their advantage, but you really got to vet them. You really got to figure out if they're a good match. Have they seen your movie? A lot of times they haven't even seen your movie, right? Yep, yep. That's the biggest thing. It's like, what was your favorite part of the film? That's like <laughs> one question that you need to, like if you, if you don't ask that and they don't answer that, that's like, hang up. Like don't even like continue the conversation. <laughs> You know, how do, how do you sell something that you haven't watched yourself? You know, I mean, it's it's ridiculous. Uh, but that is the world we live in with distribution. So how do you demonstrate value to a prospect, potential prospect? Yeah, so there's a, a lot of ways to demonstrate value, um, you know, as a filmmaker. So, you know, one thing, you know, like your demo reel, for example, that's an example is something that's like a collateral that's selling uh, your services and um, what you can bring to the table. Same thing with headshots. Um, you know, sales decks, like pitch decks of a film Um, and making sure that, you know, when you're creating this collateral that is very professional looking because, you know, this is going to be in the hands of decision makers and and buyers and, um, you know, other people in the industry. And you really want to ensure that, you know, you're putting great stuff out there that really reflect your professionalism as well. Now, how about um, for screenwriters? How, how, How can screenwriters provide value? Yeah, so for screenwriters, um, you know, have, having those those scripts, uh, you know, for a variety of different, um, you know, uh, like genres. So, for example, if, you know, you, you're a com- com- comedy writer, right? And then, like, drama, having kind of, like, different uh, variations there um, if, if a producer requests it. Um, but also, you know, um, getting out there, uh, like, like, like with like film festivals as well. Like if your film has won any like screenplays, that's like, you know, a screenplay contest, that's uh-huh. demonstrating value as well. So, and as far as should, should you also create, I mean, pitch decks and stuff like that for screenplays or is that overkill unless you're actually trying to produce it? I, I think there's never any hurt in doing that. I mean, you know, it's, it's really 
any way that you can put a visual aspect to the project to mm-hmm. make the fire decision maker really kind of see it, I, I think is always great things. Um, I, I think that that's definitely recommended for sure. And is this kind of like value based? Is this kind of like value based selling when you're yeah. doing this kind of stuff? Exactly. You know, it's like the value that you can bring them for sure. Now, any tips on closing the deal? So, as far as closing the deal, um, you know. You really want to ensure that you guys are on the same page in terms of, um, you know, the project, the service, uh, and that kind of goes in with, uh, you know, understanding like uh, contracts and agreements. I I mean, I would definitely recommend, you know, not doing anything without contracts, uh, as you can, you know, agree. I've heard some horror stories on on the podcast where, you know, one person uh, didn't get like a waiver for for the, uh, you know, for physical appearance on the film and the the distribution company won't distribute it because they don't have that waiver. And then, you know, the whole project falls apart. And, you know, hundreds and thousands of dollars, are, you know, go to waste. So having those agreements in place is definitely important. Um, and, yeah, uh, what, what, what else? Uh, closing deals, closing deals. Tips on closing Close. the deal. Yeah. And then as far as, like, uh, you know, the, the type of close, right? So there's different types of close that you can do, like uh, assumptive closes, right, where, you know, you assume that, you know, that they're, they're, they're sold on your project. Let's say you're a DP, right? And like, you know, the producer you're speaking to, a director you're speaking to, you know, has three other DPs that they're, you know, kind of talking to, um, you know, maybe like aligning your, uh, your projects and your background and your expertise and, and, and how you can bring it to the table and demonstrating that value, you know, saying, okay, so when, when does shooting start, right? Like sometimes that confidence there can really help you know, elevate you and, and show that, you know, this is somebody who's really passionate and wants to, to work on this project. Now, and how do you handle objections uh, or fears of uh, your potential prospect? So there are different types of objections out there. Um, objections come from anything from like time. Um, you know, let's say the person doesn't have any time to read your script or, um, you know, they're not in need of your service, right? Um, so really understanding the type of objection that you're getting right off the bat is really critical. Um, because then you can really, you know, um, strategize on ways to combat that objection. Um, so think of objections as you know, very welcoming. You really want objections in the sales cycle because objections means that they're having that kind of dance with you, right? Like if, if you were a lost cause, they wouldn't have even interacted with you in the first place, right? So, you know, it, it's just a matter of, you know, demonstrating that value and reconnecting to their you know, propositions and, and uh, you know, goals and, and pain points um, and, and see how you can connect um, with both of them. Now, and what is relationship success? So relationship success is the last stage of the sales cycle. Um, that's when the sale has been done, everything's closed, but it's actually, you know, everyone thinks that once you close the deal, once you get the job, once you, you know, get the girl, it's like done with, right? But really, you know, it just starts at that point, right? So customer success is continually providing that value um, and, and you know, checking in with that person and making sure that, you know, you're delivering what you're spo- what you want, right? If you're a writer working on a contract term, um, you know, am, am I, you know, getting these these edits and drafts in at, at, a, at the right time, right? Um, am I delivering on what I promised, right? Am I bringing the value to you that I have originally proposed? Um, and then, you know, finding ways to get referrals and, you know, additional, uh, maybe like upselling in a sense, right? Um, so, for example, if you're working with a particular company as a freelance, you know, videographer or, or filmmaker who's making like commercial videos, right? Maybe there's a way to make additional uh, videos for them or, you know, find out about their sister company that also needs video collateral as well that you can produce. Um, so that's really what customer success is really all about. Fascinating conversation, sir. It's always it's always good to uh, to teach and, and instruct filmmakers on how to sell themselves and sell their projects because it's so 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 important. Now I'm going to ask you a few uh, questions. I ask all my guests. What advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? So I would say um, I would I would think of yourself as an entrepreneur. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the, the paradigm of shift of like film just the past you know, 10 years, um, you know, it, it's really a, a self, you know, um, promotional endeavor. Right. So really, you know, think of yourself as a business and, and go out there and, and uh, get it going and don't wait on anyone else.
Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Long, uh, that's a good question. Longest, uh, I'd say, you know, understanding that, you know, what you're passionate about and, um, you know, what, like, you know, what you want to create might not align with other people, but that's okay. Cause you'll find, you know, your tribe, just like, you know, you you found your tribe of people mm -hmm. that really, you know, agree and are, you know, passionate about what you're putting out into the world. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's exactly how it'll end. And three of your favorite films of all time. All right. So I'd have to say I'm a big Scorsese fan. So mm -hmm. I'd say Casino, uh, Goodfellas. And then I'll just throw in a random funny one, Rat Race. Do you remember Rat Race? Oh, God, yeah. I remember Rat Race. That was a while ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very random. First time on the show, sir. <laughs> First time Rat Race is on the show. I, I know that film. It's like a... Yeah, it was a, a ton of different uh, celebrities or actors. Yeah, Goldberg, Mark, uh, yeah. what is his name? Cuban, uh, Gooding Jr. Yeah, yeah. everybody, was, uh, was, everybody. Yeah, was, everybody yep. was in that thing. I remember it was uh, it was a fun film, if I remember correctly. Um, and now, where can people find um, uh, find more about you, and how can they purchase the book? So yeah, you could actually go to alectrachtenberg.com. Um, so I actually consult uh, one to one, um, you know, with uh, not only filmmakers, but entrepreneurs on really how to establish that, you know, um, sales mindset and follow the five stages of the sales process to really, um, you know, get, uh, you know, what they what they want. Right. Whether that be a job, um, you know, connections, um, so forth. And then my book's available on Amazon um, and uh, Barnes and Noble. It's uh, Lights, Camera, Sell. So I'm sure I'll give you the link. Yeah, it will be in the show notes. Alec, thank you so much for being on the show, brother. I really appreciate your time, man. Thank you. Yeah.